The debate about the war against Iraq has divided many along the political spectrum, but the ambivalence over the administration's policy on Iraq has created rifts not just between the conservatives and the liberals. The liberal left is not unanimous in its assessment of the Iraqi question. Tonight we talk to some of the leading voices and their dilemma about Iraq. Here with me in New York is David Reed, contributing editor for the New Republic. His new book is A Bed for the Night, Humanitarianism in Crisis. Michael Walzer is a professor at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton. He is also the editor of Dissent. Harold Coe is a professor of international law at Yale Law School. He served as Assistant Secretary of Democracy, Human Rights and Labor in the Clinton administration. And in Washington, Christopher Hitchens, columnist for Vanity Fair. His new book is Why Orwell Matters. I am pleased to have each of them here. What I would like to do, because we as uh, frequently come to the question of Iraq on this program, is to take four very interesting people and have them explore this issue of Iraq and how they have, in terms of their own personal journey, come to conclusions about the war. Michael, let me begin with you. Well, I, I, I supported the Gulf War in 91 because uh, it was a response to an act of aggression to the invasion of a neighboring country. Um, and I strongly support, I would have supported a war to enforce the inspection system in the middle 90s because that was a, that was a, a, a system imposed with the authority of the United Nations and it was justly imposed and it was important to try to sustain it. But there was no willingness to, to do that. And now I support an effort to make the inspections work, um, if necessary, with force, but only if, if necessary. Any other conditions for your support, like you know, multilateralism and, and a UN Security Council resolution? I th the enforcement, the, the ceasefire in 91 was a, was a multilateral effort. It was authorized, it was implemented by the United Nations. And that is the basis for the inspection system, for the no-fly zones, and it should be the basis for the re-imposition of the inspection system. The UN, though, has to, has to do better than it did in the 90s. My and, interest in this subject was, and in, in, in some of the people here, was, was, you know, stimulated by this piece in the New York Times Magazine. You'll see the liberal quandary of Iraq. Why is the Vietnam generation not marching against Iraq? The answer has something to do with Bosnia. You had something to do with Bosnia. Tell me what the answer is here. And had, how does Bosnia had, play a role? Well, I had a lot to do with Bosnia, and I very strongly supported the idea of a war in Bosnia. I lived in Bosnia for most of the war. I, I did my best to write articles that would make people angry about what was going on in Bosnia and make people understand that Bosnia was a fledgling democracy being faced with a fascist attempt to destroy it. My problem with the Iraq war, which I'm afraid I may be here under false pretenses, Charlie, because I'm not conflicted at all. I'm completely against this war. I do not believe in democracy building out of whole cloth. For me, the essential difference between Bosnia and Iraq was in Bosnia, I think, the democratic countries, the Western countries, the United States first and foremost, should have gone in to help a fellow democracy, however fledgling. In Iraq, we're talking about a country that's never been a democracy. We're talking about nation building, not just in the political and developmental sense, but in the moral sense as well. And I think that is, as I said in that article, a revolution too far. Yeah, you basically say it's, so, it's okay to support democracy, but it's not necessarily okay to impose democracy. I see no basis for thinking we can do it. Uh, it, it there are a lot of people who would like there to be a democracy, although most of them uh, seem to be uh, to have other agendas as well, to put it charitably, not all, but many. And uh, there, there's no basis in Iraqi history for thinking this is a moment of democratic opening. What there are people in, uh, in the opposition who say they are Democrats. But I think the likelier outcome of this war, frankly, is a fragmentation of Iraq, a war between Shia and Sunni. Uh, every disaster in the book. And uh, that, again, seems to me on prudential grounds a very good reason not to go in. Okay, I, I would, would necessarily follow up now and talk about containment, but I want to get everybody mm -hmm. some here on the table. Christopher, you did not support the Gulf War in 91, and yet no one has been more vocal, it seems to me, uh, in terms of being supportive of a war against Iraq than you have. No, and here would be why I disagree with myself, and also, if I may, with just a, a line of your introduction, uh, Charlie, where you said a, a war on Iraq, or even a war with, I forget quite I what you I said. I think I said a war against Iraq is what a I war said. war against, yes. It, well, actually, I'd criticize that even more. Um, 
Uh, let me mention you criticize someone it? I, let me well, just let me this. mention let me mention a friend of mine um, Dr. Baram Sali who's now the elected prime minister of um, one part of Iraqi Kurdistan who says the term he prefers is a war for Iraq uh, I would say at least we can say a war okay. over Iraq or a war about Iraq okay, fair it's enough, a quarrel it's a quarrel with Saddam Hussein's regime and there are many reasons, which, I think, why that why that which is in control in Iraq today. So therefore, yes, but yeah, but it's, but uh, let us look. I'm replying directly in a way to David here, to David Reef. Let's look at the bit of Iraq that is controlled by the, the Kurdish and Turkoman uh, population, uh, which exempt from Saddam's control and protected by the um, no-fly zones. Here you have 21 newspapers, several political parties, <coughs> internet cafes, free travel. Free trade. This is, by the way, in the most mountainous and tribal, and in some ways most backward part of the country. And over the last ten or eleven years, they've created something like a democratic civil society. That I think is pretty impressive. Um, that's not, therefore, to be utopian to say n no question that Iraq can do better than it's doing, or, or be done by better by its friends and allies. I consider myself in this matter to be an ally of the Iraqi and Kurdish opposition, and I think that's being true to the same principles with which one was opposed to. Previous interventions, though. No, is this somehow you looked at a conclusion and you backed up to find reasons that you could make to arrive at that conclusion? Well, I'm, I, I would feel very bad about myself if that's if that's how I sounded. Um, I'd rather just stand by what I just said. Um, it, uh, there's an irony here, if I can draw attention to one, though. A lot of people, I think in America as well as in the region, believe the United States is all-powerful. Um, it's a common myth, as you know, throughout the Middle East. The United States is behind everything. And I'm afraid the idea of omnipotence has infected some of our policy intellectuals, too, and some of the people in the administration. They think what we say goes. The fact is that options are very limited at the moment in Iraq. Another disagreement with what David and what Michael Wiltz has said. The, the collapse, the, dis the uh, implosion of the Saddam Hussein regime is coming anyway. It's coming like Christmas. We're going very soon to be faced, whatever we do, with all the ghastly consequences of a post-Saddam Iraq, which will include, indeed, Sunni-Shia rivalry, other regional rivalries, the possible intervention of um, neighboring countries, a revenge killing, um, innumerable uh, unpleasant possibilities. But they do include also the possibility I just mentioned, that of a more democratic and pluralist Iraq, as exemplified in the areas that are not run by Saddam Hussein. Mm -hmm. So knowing that we're going to have to decide on a post-Saddam Iraq anyway, what are the alternatives? Are we in fact already at war or not? I would say there's merely a truce at the moment in what's been a very long quarrel with the Saddam Hussein regime. It would be far better to have a, a public and democratic argument about how best to condition the post-Saddam situation. And in my view, the best way to do that is to say we are firmly on the side of his foes and his enemies and we we want for Iraq what they want. And that supplies a standard by which the administration can be judged if, if for any reason it doesn't live up to it. All right. we'll, we'll so it means, that, it means the critique can go on even if the intervention is, um, in the military sense, successful. Harold. Uh, well, I think everyone here would look forward to a post-Saddam uh, democratic Iraq. The question is, is this the best way to get us there? I think we have to lay the uh, uh, war against Iraq on top of the war against terrorism, and that raises three points. First, the real possibility that the war against Iraq will divert us from the battle against al-Qaeda, which I think is the one that's really threatening and frightful to people in America. A second point is by President Bush saying, uh, if you're not with us, uh, you're with the terrorists, suggests that uh, if you don't favor a war against Iraq, you must somehow uh, be willing to accept the status quo in which there may be another attack on the United States. In fact, as I think Michael has pointed out, there's a third way, which is you could favor disarming Iraq without attack. And third, I think the point which uh, David has made, democracy building is hard, and particularly democracy building post-conflict. The fact of the matter is that December 5, 2002 was the first anniversary of the Bonn Agreement following uh, uh, the attack on Afghanistan. And the fact of the matter is Afghanistan is so far from a democratic situation uh, that uh, it makes you have serious doubts as to where we would be uh, a year from now, even if we had a completely successful military campaign against Iraq. So, but what, you, what, the, the, go ahead, like, Christopher. What don't you like about the new Afghanistan? Well, I'll what don't you like about the it? new Afghanistan, Christopher? It's very simple. The United States has blocked almost every effort at serious development, at serious peacekeeping. It's the U.S. command that prevented 
the spreading out of the UN commanded ISAF forces. Surely one has some right in this wait, matter wait, wait, when wait. you talk about a democratic Iraq yes. to, to look at the record of the United States in post conflict by, situations. By all, by and the means, record but, by is all means, terrible. but you'd be making the case, then you would surely therefore be making the case, in fact, you just were for more intervention or better intervention rather than less. Come on, listen to your own argument. No. The fact is the population of Afghanistan has gone up by a million and a half of its citizens who want to come back. Don't forget the four million Iraqis forced to live outside their country who also, have, who also have the right, kind of who also have the right of return. And the, uh, the condition of at least 50% of the population, those of the feminine gender, is obviously improved. It's no longer the headquarters of a, of a lethal Conspiracy. That's I, not I, bad I for a year's ago. I don't disagree with Christopher that, that uh, if you're going to do intervention, you need to do more. The fact of the matter is that uh, Iraq is a place that needs more of our resources than it has now, and we're about to take on a major new challenge. And I think we all tell Wait, our. Wait, I'm sorry, I think you meant to say Afghanistan, didn't Af you? Afghanistan, Afghanistan is a place that needs we, more we, of our resources. We, yeah. we all tell our children, you know, finish your old uh, job right before you take on something uh, new and more difficult. And I think the fact of the matter is that. Uh, uh, Afghanistan is desperately insecure. Uh, Kabul uh, is, uh, is in a place where there are very few peacekeepers. Warlords and drug lords patrol much of the rest of the country. We have not made serious commitments with regard to uh, democracy building. We're years away from <coughs> free and fair elections. And if that's a situation there, what will be the situation in Iraq in, uh, in uh, a year from okay. now? Let me just ask this. Go ahead, Michael, and then I'll come back. We would have to do, the, the one successful example is Germany after World War II. We would have to conquer Iraq entirely. We would have to occupy it for years. We would have to rebuild it in, with massive, massive investment. And, and all that was done by a much better government, a government in the United States, much more committed to democracy in Europe than we have now, a government that doesn't seem to be really committed to democracy in Afghanistan, and only rhetorically, I think, to democracy in, in Iraq. This all, that, all sounds, well, that all sounds like hard-headed and realistic and practical, but in fact it's extraordinarily utopian. I mean, do you not agree with me that the implosion of the Saddam Hussein regime is coming? That, the, that you will either have to face uh, a, a collapsed and imploded Iraq with or without a policy very soon. Now, to say that there will be innumerable difficulties here, as there are in Afghanistan, seems to me to be no more than trite. Well, I don't think it's established that the regime is falling, Christopher. That's a, oh. That gives you a, a well, very good disagree. reason to be able to say, well, there's going to be an intervention one way or another. But as, a, I mean, frankly speaking, simply from an American perspective, I, I have to come back to the John Adams question about whether it's the job of the United States to go out and defeat monsters. That, you know, there is an assumption but, in, the, but, but, in the invasion talk that it is our job to make a democratic Iraq. And frankly, I challenge that as well. I'm not well, persuaded that it is the duty of the United States to create democracies. It is true that Ronald Reagan, whom you're now echoing, Christopher, said no small dreams for America. But I don't see why that in, it entails us to do this. On what basis should the United States be determining the future of Iraq by force of arms. You can nitpick all you like about this issue of war on Iraq, war against Saddam Hussein. But when those bombs start to fall, they will fall on Iraqis. And they will largely not distinguish the politics, however carefully the targeting is and, done. And if you think the Iraqis living today, today in, would they choose, as some have suggested, they would rather the United States come and they're willing to pay some of that price. And I'm not suggesting well, we have some, anybody... we have some evidence about that. What's the evidence that Iraqis want to see United States uh, and perhaps uh, United Nations well, forces coming there to liberate them? I'm saying that in the only place where opinion can be tested without fear um, or without uh, coercion, uh, it's practically unanimous. I wouldn't presume to speak for the citizens of Baghdad, and I, I actually don't think probably David Reif should do so either. Charlie but the, the, yeah. we know that there's a, a very large uh, Shia slum belt population around Baghdad where Saddam City, it's called rather insultingly, mm. where such opinion as has been tested seems very hostile to the regime. As I said earlier, there are four million Iraqis forced to live outside their country. We have a very, very good idea of what okay, Chris, they well, think. I, I, believe they I believe they have the right of return, by the way. I've, uh, there's, a, there's a very, very strong indication that a regime, furthermore, that insists on 100% turnout 
and 100% vote isn't very sure of its popular base. Okay, but there is an obvious point that you well know, which is that on the one hand, you can wish a regime would be overthrown. Another is to wish that somebody would, would come and bomb your homeland in order to overthrow the regime. Those are two very different points. No, but these, these, I'm saying, these people say they wish that a regime change would come and they believe it can only be conditioned from outside. Now, that wouldn't give the United States the right on its own, of course. You have to prove at least three or four other things, I believe. One, that Iraq is a threat to its neighbors, again, which it, it certainly is, and would be if it wasn't forcibly disarmed, even more so. Uh, third, and I wish there was more emphasis on this, uh, the, the evidence that Saddam Hussein should be tried for crimes against humanity, war crimes, and under the Genocide Convention need only be taken off the shelf. We have all the files necessary for that arraignment. I think it's to the disgrace of the U.S. government that it doesn't make use of them and say that that's another warrant that it's executing. That's uh, unfortunately yeah. because it doesn't agree with the International War Crimes Tribunal and indeed until today appointed for its own investigative commission someone who would also be hunted by it. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I can't speak for the administration. And then there's the question, which uh, uh, Dr. Coe seems to me underestimated, of the connection between Saddam Hussein and international gangsterism. Uh, uh, we, he, last weekend, Saddam Hussein made a speech calling for a common front of jihad with the al-Qaeda forces in Kuwait against the British, the, the Americans, and the Jews. Well, Chris, That's the day still, he hands over the documents. We're, we're still waiting. We're he's, still the waiting who, the he's the man who, uh, he's the man who, who organized the, okay, Chris, man who organized the Abu Nidal network. Yes, but you won't have to wait all that long. And all the pieces of evidence that we do have are very suggestive of at least a non-aggression Let me get Harold in. Between the Iraqi Ba'ath Party <laughs> and the Al-Qaeda network. My, Michael made a very important point, which I think should not be lost, which is the, the multilateral route. The fact of the matter is that the, uh, the situation in Iraq has a, been a multilateral matter now for more than a decade. And the Bush administration, after uh, fainting down one road, has wisely gone down the road where it's coming into the situation with maximum uh, international legitimacy. And I think having gotten to this point, it has to continue down that road if it's going to enter uh, a post-conflict Iraq in a situation where it can actually do the building. The fact of the matter is, if the UN is not in on the takeoff of this, it will not be in on the reconstruction and will look like an American-imposed, uh, quote, democracy. And I think it's important to say that this is not simply an issue about which liberals are in quandary. I think that uh, much of the foreign policy team that surrounded the first President Bush has exactly the same set of concerns, and they are the ones who helped to push the multilateral route which the president has taken to this point. If Christopher is right that Iraq is going to implode by itself, that's the strongest possible argument against doing, uh, anything. Against let, it doing let it happen. Let it happen and let's see how, what social forces are at work there and, and how, they, how they engage. And, and then maybe there would be an occasion to support the democratic movement inside, uh, inside Iraq if it appears. Uh, well, that I really, mean, is, being, that, excuse me, that really to... is being callous about Iraqi lives. Well, that really is being callous about them because that would mean that these changes and upheavals would take place with Saddam's uh, helicopters and Republican Guard uh, free to d help decide the matter. Well, the look, argument for an intervention, the argument for an intervention is that well, that okay. faction should be taken out. Okay, Chris Levitt, David. Look, there is, I come back to the principal issue that seems to me Americans need to think about here, which is do, does the United States, whether it's in the name of empire or human rights or both, really wish to start making various kinds of wars of altruism uh, imperial domination and altruism, because you don't make wars like that without dominating as well. The notion that the UN will be anything more than a fig leaf seems to me quite unrealistic. The actual, the talk right now in the UN is that what is being proposed by, to them by the Americans is a one-year governorship under Tommy Franks, followed by a Kosovo-style proconsulate, for which apparently Bernard Kushner, late of Kosovo, has already put himself up. Now, you know, uh, the UN in Robert this Kajin. context is doing the, 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 the <laughs> will do Kajin. the game of the Americans. But, I mean, I, I just come back to the first principle. Do, do Americans, liberal Americans, conservative Americans, I take your point about the, the debate ranging far beyond liberals, hawks, or, or otherwise. But do Americans really want to start doing this as a matter of course? What, what surprises me is the lack of doubt on this subject. Okay, but, but your principal objective, uh, objection to doing it, to using American force to create American ideals is what? 
It will overextend us. It will put make us weaker. It will make us hated. It will what? My principal objection is that it is not for the United States to create, I emphasize the word create, democracies. The, the area Christopher alludes to is a Kurdish independent region, which has a very different history from the rest of the country and for which I think extrapolation is at the very least questionable. But leave that to one side. I don't think the United States should be in the democracy creation business, particularly when what we're talking about here is not regime change, not all this stuff. We're talking about war. And when we talk about war, what we're talking about is slaughter. However careful and scrupulous the targeting, however serious the people and the American army is very serious about these matters. So okay in Bosnia, okay in okay Kosovo, support, but not okay well, I don't in know. Iraq. I mean, not okay but I must have expressed myself clock. very poorly, David. Well, then express yourself better. I must express myself very, very poorly earlier, I mean to say, when I said, it's, it, don't let's exaggerate, as the uh, fanatics in the Middle East and the extreme uh, conservative dreamers uh, sometimes are liable to do here, as if the United States can just do as it wishes and invent places to go fight in, and, or as you put it, uh, monsters to destroy. Charlie, people um, talk Or dreams about to dream. Finish, no, the fact is, th this, this confrontation has somewhat been forced upon us by Mr. Saddam Hussein. Wouldn't you at least consent to that? David. No, because it's not clear to me that this inspection regime won't work. And above all, it's not clear to me that containment, even if he's cheating, isn't working. I mean, it, again... So you it think seems, he's a rational actor? I think he is... It is irrational to make war a first resort, which is what I think the administration is doing. By but no means. Be, Look, everyone knows the administration is badly split on this. There's a big faction of the, of the conservative movement that's very strongly opposed to doing this. And for very good reasons that they, they, on the whole, like the Middle East status quo the way it is. They like Saudi Arabia the way it is. They don't want the risk of regime change. Okay. Uh, no, but, 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 but Chris, how, but let, how me, let me, before Harold jumps in, is part of your argument for the war uh, and the necessity <coughs> of regime change also because you would like to see, as some will argue, a democratic state in the Middle East which can be used as a force to spread democracy among other regimes you might not like? I certainly think, and I continue to take the example of my own solidarity with, with rather, the example of um, the, uh, the Iraqi National Congress and the, particularly the Patriarchal Union of Kurdistan, but we, we, we can't know that their victory is predetermined. Of course, we can't say, by the way, if you take my line, Iraq will become democratic. We can say it has a much better chance to do so, and its own citizens will have a say. But the, the crucial question, it seems to me, is that Saddam Hussein has refused every possibility, every, every chance of saving us from this confrontation. I, I think and is, not a, is no longer, if he ever was, a rational or credible or deterrable person. He's quite clearly a wigged out, sadistic megalomaniac. I think but not you the only, only, look, not the only you one You have only to look at the speech. Yeah. Look at the speech he made on the Sunday. His poor, intimidated, crushed officials hand over this pathetic set of documents to the UN inspectors. The, the leader then makes a speech saying what we want is a common front of jihad with the, with the jihadists Harold. against the British, the Jews, and the Americans. Harold. This is a uh, suicidal uh, despot. America is the world's most powerful nation, and its power uh, will be used, and it has to be used, uh, in my view. There's a choice. Use it to extend its power or use it in a way which is consistent with a system of norms and values which it helped to create. And it seems to me that uh, if we keep focusing on the ways in which the U.S. is a problem, we forget the ways in which the U.S. can be the solution. But I think what that means is that the U.S. has to act within the framework that, in fact, enhances its own soft power and promotes the kinds of values that it's most interested in supporting. And I think that means here, following a multilateral path, working within the system that it created. It has a, uh, a, a unanimous Security Council resolution to this point, continue to work within that system uh, with the goal of ultimately uh, trying to first to disarm Iraq without attack, and if that's not necessary, then they move to the next stage, but move in that direction with multilateral support, which then makes a post-war construction possible. Who's arguing against you? To whom was that a reply? Well, probably to me, Christopher. Uh, I don't see why you need to be so, to concede that much, I, in all candor. I, it is perfectly true that the dominant view in Washington these days, and perhaps among the American elite these days, is that American power is going to be used one way or the other. So let's, as, I mean, to, to put another version on what you just said, let's make it, uh, let, let's put it in the service of, of a decent cause. 
Uh, I don't concede that at all. But, I don't see why we have to. Have the service of a decent cause. I want in the United Bosnia. States to support another legitimate state, Bosnia. I, it was for me an exceptional choice. Not in terms of a, a war fought in the name of altruism. I've supported other wars on the base of international law as the Gulf War in 91, right. which I right. supported right. too. But I mean, those were war or huh. war in Afghanistan, which I considered a war of self defense. But the idea that we did it to get the burkas off ladies in Kabul seems to me just DOD propaganda. But the, the, um, but I supported the war nonetheless. But I do think there is an issue for Americans about whether we want America's mission to be fighting monsters multilaterally or unilaterally. Well, and that's the question I would the ask you. It depends Michael. on what the monsters are doing. When there is mass murder or ethnic cleansing, somebody should stop it. It doesn't always have to be us. Uh, it was the Vietnamese who went into Cambodia and shut down the killing fields. It was the Tanzanians who marched into Uganda and this overthrew the murderous Idi Amin regime. It doesn't, I, I'm, I'm strongly in favor of a division of labor. It doesn't always have to be us. But if it falls on us because no one else it's does it, falling on us, then, it's, then it's, we're, when, we're, when, we're choosing. When genocide is going on, anybody who can stop it should stop it. But that's not, that's not the situation in Iraq. What is the situation in Iraq? In, I mean, where is it the point we, of difference with you and Christopher about the urgency well, no, of the genocide action. convention the genocide convention could undoubtedly be invoked against Saddam Hussein and should have been invoked much earlier than it was it, it, it may be the case that our that we are already intervening in Iraq to prevent mass murder with the no-fly zones the protection Such of is already Kurdish, indeed of Kurdish the case. autonomy but that means that mass murder is not occurring such is so, already indeed the case so, and unfortunately for Professor Ko it, it, it couldn't be done multilaterally because not enough countries would agree that it was important enough. That's the sad fact of the matter. I mean, the, the no-fly zones do not have a UN warrant. The Iraqis indeed are within their rights to fire at those planes. I wish, of course, I'm sure Professor Coe wishes the same, that more countries had agreed to take part in enforcing the no-fly zone, but they didn't. So the question was, was someone going to do it or not? Or was there going to be another Rwanda on our watch in northern Iraq and southern Iraq too? Well, I, now, these are, the, 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 I don't the, think these are questions that can be very easily evaded. I, I think it's a, it's a mistake to say that these are only American values. The fact of the matter is that uh, what needs to happen here is a coalition building around Wait, a certain Wait, who said they values. were only American uh, values? Chris, let me finish. Who are you really. disagreeing with? Uh, and, let him finish, Christopher. And uh, I think the fact of the matter is that the, the entire purpose of having a UN is to address these problems collectively and according to certain common values, and that therefore when the U.S turns to the UN, tries to get the UN to support this, to build a co coalition, and, and waits to build this consensus, uh, it's worth supporting that. However, I think the, 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 the real question down the road will be, uh, if uh, the Bush administration concludes we cannot disarm Iraq without attack, and the Security Council wants to keep trying, I would think that the Bush administration should continue going down the multilateral road since I think it's the only one that guarantees it long-term success in carrying out mm -hmm. the reconstruction of a post-Saddam uh, democratic Iraq. But th that depends on, ha on the behavior of the Security Council. If, if, if our European allies and, um, and the other members of the Security Council decide to pretend that the inspections are working when everybody in the world knows they're not working, then unilateral action to to disarm Iraq might be might be justified, but but short of that, we should certainly make every effort to find a way to make the to we have to let the inspections work if they can work, and I hope the Europeans will have some sense of an obligation to make them to make them work. Do you think the inspections can work, Christopher? And and if so, where does that take you? Well, some of us are prisoners of, of a certain amount of knowledge about this. Um, Kofi Annan wanted the inspections, but he wanted them to be, or agreed to them, he wanted them to be run by Rolf Achaeus, a rather brilliant Swedish diplomat who had a proven record of success with inspections after 1991. The regime, Mr. Professor Walter said he was willing to go to war over, or for. Um, his appointment uh, was vetoed by the envoys of France and Russia, who were indebted and or bribed by Saddam Hussein, uh, on the grounds that he had a record of proven success. They wanted instead a man Hans Blix with a record of proven failure. These are the facts. Mr. Uh, Mr. Blix certified Iraq twice in the 80s and 90s. He certified North Korea, if it comes to that. He was, he's put in by, by a, a Saddam Hussein's clientele. The, this platonic talk about let inspections work 
seems to me to be so much piffle. They're not designed to work. And if you want, if you're sincere about inspections, you have to be the government of Iraq in order to certify what you've got. So much must be clear. No one else can know except the government. So a real call for, for inspections, a, a call that really says we want to find out, is the equivalent of a call for regime change. I think the question is whether uh, America's only tool in this circumstance is u force and the threat of force, or whether it's a more a complicated toolkit which includes force, diplomacy, moral leadership uh, of a coalition based on a certain set of values. I think uh, uh, certainly Colin Powell has pushed the administration toward the latter view, force mixed with diplomacy, mixed with values, and I think that that's the best way to go for the long term. Here's the other issue which, David, you basically don't think this is America's war to make and you don't think that we should go out trying to create democracies. Uh, do you fear some results if in fact we do go in to Iraq, in terms of what it might do to the Arab neighbors, in terms of whether it will create regional <coughs> conflicts, in terms of whether it will fan the flames of anti-Americanism, all of that. Well, I think and is that a serious issue? Yes, of course it's a serious issue. It's only in this crazy triumphalist mood in Washington at the moment, this this kind of Ameri get what is the phrase that one of the DOD people used not so long ago either get with the program or get out of the way or to use the president's phrase you're either with us or against us which goes against all of diplomatic history and wisdom for all of recorded history the idea there are no neutrals give me a break but in this context a war that is widely perceived in the West of the world as an unjust and imperial war can only harm our interests in other parts of the world. I do agree about the terrorism issue. I don't believe the links to Saddam have been proven in any case, but even if they were, the idea that we can really that easily afford to make 20,000 new uh, jihadis, new suicide bombers, the idea that we want to support the Sharon government, which this war will absolutely and ineluctably do. It will strengthen the hand of the people in Israel committed to the worst things as opposed to the people in Israel okay. committed to much better things. All these things seem to me as certain as the strife that okay. will follow uh, from the war. You agree with that, Michael? I think that the war will bring all the consequences that Christopher was uh, was talking about, plus possibly many others. But I, we have to be careful about that because the, the, your list was predicted for Afghanistan with absolute certainty. If we fought and in Afghanistan, for, if we fought Bosnia. through Ramadan, yeah. all these terrible things would happen. The Arab street would go up in flames. It seems only the Arabs have a street. Uh, Not only the Arab street, the, the European street won't go up in flames, but the divorce between the United States and its Western European allies, and they still al are allies, will be that much more pronounced and that much more dangerous in the long term to America's global interests. Well, I, think, I think where uh, the Milosevic example is instructive is if, if we create a, a very simple on-off switch, either uh, a war against Saddam very soon, uh, or uh, doing nothing, uh, or, or accepting close to nothing, we leave out the third way. Here's where I agree completely with Christopher. With Milosevic, uh, several exits, uh, exit options were developed from Milosevic. The one which ended up happening was him leaving, going to The Hague and being tried. Here, the U.S., rather than trying to develop uh, an international uh, prosecution track that might accept or uh, address the problem, has, uh, in fact, turned against the International Criminal Court, which has been very counterproductive. And I think one of the questions here is the military strategy here seems to assume the immaculate uh, decapitation strike. Uh, if that doesn't work and Saddam is not uh, hit in the first round, that's where the military scenario starts to become very problematic and uh, uh, with many civilian casualties and the like. So I think that the danger here is having only two options, my way or the highway. I think uh, we have to talk about the, the third options that achieve the, the results that we think are are the best for the situation. And how would that apply here? I think that it means that the uh, the disarming multilateral strategy has to be mm. used first. Yeah. I think that... How did uh, I know you were going to say that? <laughs> well, I saw the contempt on your space. Let me... No, I'm just sorry. I was, it, it was becoming... The, of the idea, not of... of her. I don't no, think, you know, I think I, 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 I'm not here to speak for the administration. And anyway, they certainly wouldn't uh, invite me to be their advocate. But. I don't think that there is a historical triumphalist. Uh, but I think what Christopher here. is saying is that, that this is the moment where regime, it's a regime change or nothing, where I think many people would say 
that with the war on terrorism and other priorities, our central concern is eliminating a nuclear uh, or, or weapons of mass destruction threat. And that makes sense. Well, I don't see why these things have to priority. oppose each other. If I was to say that the, my, I rested my entire case on the genocide convention and the, and the execution of a warrant against Saddam Hussein for crimes against humanity and war crimes, you wouldn't say to me, well, that's all very well, but shouldn't we be fighting the war on terrorism also? I mean, that would be making two good ideas a prisoner of each other uh, uh, to the accomplishment of neither. Don't make the best the enemy of the good, in other words. But I mean, there are, there the are at least four very terrorism. good reasons why, at least four very persuasive reasons why Saddam Hussein's regime ought to be removed and we'd all be better off, including the Iraqi people, if it, if it were. One can't always mention all four of them every time. But I, it's, it's irritating, I think, to try and put them into, uh, okay. into a, a needless opposition or antagonism to each other. I've got to close this down soon. Michael? Uh, my argument with with Christopher is a very old one. I think there's a there's a slogan on the left where we both grew up. Um, the liberation of the working class must be the work of the working class itself, and I think that applies not only to class politics. It applies to democratic politics generally. To overthrow it. You, 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 it has to be done. I mean, we can stop mass murder. We can stop, we should stop ethnic cleansing. When people are desperate, in desperate trouble, when people are radically helpless, then intervention is justified. But tyrannies, authoritarian regimes, class hierarchies have to be overthrown from within. Christopher, I have that's to why, end it there. That's why, that's why Karl Marx called for the firing of General McClellan and the hiring of General Grant. He thought that these good causes might need a bit of muscle behind them. <laughs> it's Thank true. You. Look you. it up. He was, he was Lincoln's best promoter <laughs> in Europe at a time when the Europeans didn't support Mr. Lincoln. They thank supported the Confederacy instead. Christopher, thank you for joining us. Anytime. Harold, thank you very much. Thank you, man. Thank you, David. Thank you. We'll be right back. Stay with us.